Solving a cold case requires teamwork, dedication, and an unrelenting pursuit of justice. But what leads or choices are the authorities left with when they are unable to even identify the remains of the victim? What route do these crime cases take when the lifeless body of a victim is unidentified for almost four decades? But the one thing that detectives in these cases can be proud of is their never giving up attitude toward the investigation. They recognized the work that needed to be done to get the victim's family some answers. And for that, they could not be prouder. Today in this video, we are going to look into the three most insane criminal cases, from serial killers to detectives and technological genius. These cases have everything. If intrigued, get on board with Mysterious 7 to explore the events of these insane cases. Number 1. The skeletal remains of a Utah woman were identified by authorities after four decades of her mysteriously vanishing. This is the story of Sandra Maddett, whose husband reported her missing, but was later held responsible for her disappearance. On July 18, 1979, Warren Maddett called the Salt Lake City Police Department to report his wife as a missing person. It had been eight days since the 37-year-old Sandra Maddett was last seen at a bar in Salt Lake City, Utah. She was wearing a digital watch and a ring with a turquoise stone at the time of her disappearance, and she also wore dentures, which she often took out because they were ill-fitting and hurt her mouth. The police department started their investigation into Sandra's disappearance immediately, but whenever the follow-up detective tried to contact Warren Maddett to discuss his missing wife, they couldn't reach him. Eventually, they lost contact with him entirely, and the investigation made little headway. One month after Sandra's disappearance, 200 miles from where Sandra disappeared, a grisly discovery was made in Millard County, Utah. A hunting party had found human remains near the I-15 Cofort exit, close to the old 91 road. Since the remains were almost all skeletal and no apparent signs pointed to a cause of death, police couldn't immediately identify who the remains belonged to. However, they did find jewelry at the scene and saw that the skull was missing teeth. The case was then given the moniker of the Toothless Jane Doe. The Millard County Sheriff's Office opened a homicide investigation and tried to identify the body by sending out bulletins, reaching out to the community, and commissioning a sketch based on the skull, but they had no success. Due to a lack of technology and communication between the states, the connection to Sandra was never made. Five years later, in Salt Lake City, there was a potential break-in in Saunders' case. Serial killer Henry Lee Lucas had been apprehended and confessed to killing Sandra Maddett. The lead investigator and sheriff met with Lucas, but his claims about the crime were vague, and they couldn't confirm whether his confession was legitimate or not. Lucas couldn't provide enough details about the murder to prove to investigators that he was responsible for it. Lucas later recanted his confessions to hundreds of murders across the U.S. and was only found responsible for a handful of them. It was back to the drawing board for the investigators. In early 2013, a Salt Lake City Police Department detective was reassigned to Sandra's case. The detective first established that Sandra was still missing after all these years, and so he entered her case information into two missing person databases. During this time, Sandra's family disclosed that they believed Warren Maddett, her husband, was likely responsible for her murder. They also speculated that Sandra was missing long before her husband reported it, which could have conflicted with the original timeline. This would have been the time for police to reach out to Warren Maddett for further questioning, but they discovered that he had died in California on October 11, 1999. In 2019, the Millard County Sheriff's Office started looking at the Jane Doe case again. That same year, a state law was passed that made it mandatory for state crime labs to enter unidentified remains into national databases for missing people. So in February of 2019, Sandra was added to Utah's cold case database as a cold case missing person. Her case information was also added to a federal database that helps law enforcement personnel identify and prosecute violent criminals nationally. Sergeant Pat Bennett of the Millard County Sheriff's Office then joined cases to identify Jane Doe and began to search the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System 
to try to find an ID match. That's when he came across Sandra's case file. He saw that she was wearing a watch and a ring with a turquoise stone at the time of her disappearance, which matched the details of the unidentified remains found just one month after she was reported missing. In November of 2019, Bennett reached out to the Salt Lake City Police Department about his hunch, and they started working together on getting a DNA comparison. By December, Utah's forensic anthropologist had completed a report that allowed the unidentified remains of the Jane Doe to be sent to the University of Texas's Human Identification Center for DNA testing. The remains were sent in October of 2020, and on August 10, 2021, it was confirmed that the unidentified remains belonged to Sandra Maddett. On August 13, 2021, the Millard County Sheriff's Office and Salt Lake City Police Department gave Sandra's family the closure they had been waiting for. We are happy the case is now closed because it brings us some answers. As a family, we are happy about this development, but also sad it took this long. 42 years is a long time. We are happy that the investigators never closed the case and continued to work on it so we could reach this point said Sandra's son, Daryl Hames. Sandra's family plans to have her cremated and have her ashes made into jewelry for her sisters. The Utah Medical Examiner's Office could not confirm a cause of death for Sandra, but detectives believe her husband knew more about her death than anyone else. Though there was never a probable cause to charge him in connection with her disappearance or murder while he was still alive, Sandra's son said that her family had long suspected Maddett's involvement in Sandra's disappearance as there had been a history of domestic abuse in the relationship. Even before the case was closed, the family assumed he knew what had happened to her. It is bittersweet not to have justice in this, but Sandra's family now has some answers to what happened to her so many years ago. At the police station, yeah, I shed a tear. You know, cause, and I haven't cried in years over my mom, you know, but I did shed a tear at the police station. But I'm more happy that I have closure and... You know, I'm um, talking to the sisters and stuff like that. She was missing for all this time, so we kind of grew apart, but now... What do you guys think? Was Sandra's husband actually the murderer of his wife? Or did the authorities rush into closing this case with whatever they had available? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Number 2 After a whirlwind romance and a pregnancy, Harold Dean Klaus and Tina Lynn Klaus were married in June 1979. By 1981, the couple went missing, and their families had little closure until their bodies were exhumed and identified 40 years later. This is the story of a Houston couple, which for decades mystified the Harris County investigators who were unable to verify the identities. The Florida infant was barely a year old in 1980 when her parents, newlyweds Harold Dean Klaus and Tina Lynn Klaus, uprooted their small family and headed to Houston for a job opportunity. A few months later, the couple's family stopped hearing from them and they never saw them again. The couple's car was returned to their family after they disappeared, and relatives were led to believe the newlyweds had joined a religious cult and no longer wanted to be contacted. I spent years waiting to get a call from my son or calling police stations each time a new male body was found. I spent years with my chest on fire just waiting, Harold's mother Donna Casasanta stated. I used to tell myself, he's still out there somewhere, he'll, he'll ring the doorbell and, and, and he'll say, hey, yeah, I'm mom. In January 1981, a dog wandered into the woods and returned with a human arm in its mouth. Local police later discovered a man who was beaten to death and a woman who had been strangled. Years went by without the bodies being identified and without progress in Harold's and Tina's missing purse case simultaneously. Harris County's forensic artist Mary Mize at the time drew pastel reconstructions of the couple after their bodies were found, but nobody was able to identify the pair because they had only just moved to Houston. That was until the bodies were exhumed in 2011 and Identifinders International, a California-based organization that performs genetic genealogy for law enforcement, decided to take on the case. Allison Peacock, who worked with the genealogy and operations team with Identifinders International, called the Klaus family and confirmed the couple was Dean and Tina. However, their child Holly was never found. After whole genome sequencing was performed to extract DNA from the remains, 
the results were uploaded to genealogical databases, GEDmatch, and Family Tree DNA. It really only took hours to get a really good glimpse of who these people were, said Allison Peacock. Allison then got in touch with Klaus's sister, Debbie Brooks, and asked if family relative had disappeared a long time ago. The family was able to tell Peacock that Dean Klaus was married, leading to the identification of the second body, his wife, Tina Klaus. Brooks then asked the team if they had found the baby, but the scientists were not aware Holly Marie, who was last seen in Louisville, Texas, existed. Brooks said the family will never know full closure until those responsible for the murders are arrested and Holly is found. There is an ongoing investigation into Holly's disappearance in the Louisville, Texas area. Peacock, who now functions as the Klaus family's advocate and public relations contact, said she's working with agencies to create a progression photo that will show what Holly would look like today. The hope is the photo and multiple news articles will reach Holly or someone who knows her. Debbie and other family members have submitted swabs of their DNA to Ancestry.com and other Ancestry sites in hopes of matching with Holly or a relative who knows of her whereabouts. The Klaus family said just as they never stop searching for Harold and Tina, they'll never stop looking for Holly. The Klaus and Lynn family are now left with a lot of questions. They don't know who killed the couple and where Holly is. Finding the answers to these questions would be the last puzzle piece and the last piece of Harold and Tina. There has been no arrest in the case, even to this day. Number 3 A family from Edmonton suffered a deep shock after finding out an accused serial killer may have killed their daughter. This is the story of 35-year-old Cynthia Frances Moss, who, leaving behind two beautiful children, became one of the victims of a serial killer. A serial killer who went on a year-long killing spree that started when he was just 19. After the Second World War, government officials in the Peace Region faced a challenge. Thousands of men were returning from the front, and government policy was to settle veterans on farms. But in the Peace Region, good farmland was in short supply. The solution? Move two Treaty 8 First Nations to new reserves. For Judy Moss, Cynthia's sister, the decades-old decision to relocate what would become the Blueberry River First Nation is a link in the chain of events that led to her sister's murder at the hands of serial killer Cody Legbikoff. For Blueberry River, where Moss and her sister are originally from, the land swamp was the start of a painful relationship with oil and gas. While the details of the transition continue to be disputed, the indigenous groups that became Blueberry and Doeg River First Nations were moved from their original reserves to marginal parcels north of Fort St. John following the war. Along the way, a government official failed to transfer the mineral rights beneath the reserves, leaving the nations out of a massive oil and gas windfall in the 1970s. It should have been a victory for the nations. Instead, the huge infusion of money into a community of hunters and trappers, excess, and violence. Judy and her sisters grew up in poverty and in and out of foster care. As the youngest sister, Cynthia's family called her Cinderella. She spent her entire life with undiagnosed fetal alcohol disorders, due to wrangling between the provincial and federal governments over responsibility for First Nations health care. Shortly after the Montney win, as the court case became known, the community began to struggle with an uptick in drug and alcohol abuse. Cynthia was offered drugs while babysitting for a cousin, and her disorder made her predisposed to addiction. She eventually followed a boyfriend to Edmonton, got trapped in a relationship, and became pregnant. Cynthia came home to Fort St. John for a time to battle her addiction and get ready to be a mother. She attended treatment in Vancouver and Prince George, but ultimately her baby was taken and placed in a foster home. Cynthia Moss moved to Prince George in hopes of turning her life around, but she didn't know that her life was going to take a major wrong turn. In September 2010, Cynthia Moss went missing. The last day she was seen was when she was faxing in all of her paperwork to start the process of getting her child back into her care. She, however, didn't get the support she needed to ensure she could become a healthy parent. That alone put the last nail in her coffin. 
She disappeared sometime after that, and her remains were found the following month in a remote area of Prince George. Moss was found dead from blunt force trauma and wounds to the chest. Someone may have also sc on her neck. This high-profile case was not only difficult for the families, but also emotional for the community, which lived with constant reminders of the number of unsolved murders and disappearances of women, many of them vulnerable women, and many of them aboriginal women. In a statement, Cynthia's family asked journalists to not focus on Cynthia's lifestyle or gender, but instead on her and hopefully, therefore, help to prevent further injustices against vulnerable women in society. The family asked for better services for victims of violence, sufferers of mental health issues and addictions. The family also questioned the portrayal of many women who were victims of violence, saying the women were shown as deserving of death. Cynthia's killer would not have been caught if it wasn't for his relations with other murder cases. Police only cracked Cynthia's case after the death of a 15-year-old girl from Fraser Lake, who had met Cody Legbikoff online. Lauren Leslie was found dead on a remote logging road just off Highway 27 near Vanderhoof in November 2010. Legbikoff was arrested after an RCMP officer stopped him after he was spotted turning onto the highway from that unused logging road. The officer reported seeing a blood smear on Legbikoff's face and legs, after which he searched him and found a pool of blood in the trunk. A conservation officer suspecting poaching went up the logging road to investigate and found Leslie's body. Investigators determined she had died only several hours before Legbikoff had been arrested. Mr. Legbikoff, who was 20 years old when he was arrested, pleaded not guilty to the murders. He was, however, also charged with the deaths of Jill Stuchenko and Natasha Montgomery. Ms. Stuchenko died to the head, and her body was found in a gravel pit in October 2009. The body of Ms. Montgomery was never found, though her DNA was discovered on Mr. Legbikoff's shorts and hoodie. Her DNA was also found throughout his apartment and on his axe. The Crown's 30-minute opening statement was at times extremely graphic, as prosecutor Joseph Temple told the jury about the various traumas, fractures, and wounds the women suffered. The way the women were killed was similar to Cynthia Moss. It didn't take long for the police to make the connections. Legbikoff faced four counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Cynthia Moss, Jill Stacy, Sachenko, Natasha Lynn Montgomery, and Lauren Don Leslie. In September 2014, Cody Legbikoff was found guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and faces life in prison. Legbikoff remains to this day Canada's youngest convicted serial killer. The question now, how did Sandra Matat end up dead? Over the past week, ABC4 News has been reporting on Matat, who, after 42 years, was identified as the Jane Doe of Millard County. Now her family believes they know who killed her. Each missing person has a family, and for them, the search continues. ABC4's Marcus Ortiz joining us in studio with tonight's Missing. The cases we talked about today were peculiar in their own ways, but the common thread was that all of the bodies were identified decades after the disappearance or murder and the events leading to their identification are fascinating stories in themselves. Some cases were solved, some still are on the journey of their culmination, but what remains constant is the hope and hard work of law enforcement. What do you guys think about these cases? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, hit that like button, share this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell icon to never miss an update on much more insane crime cases.